Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Recruiters with No Limits. Always live and never scripted, I'm with my sidekick and co-host, John Ruffini. What's up, Johnny? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. It's springtime, but I just have to say real quick, it's snowing half the country yesterday. Man, was that crazy or what? Not where I am. <laughs> Palm Tree State all the time. See that, Holly? Well, hey, I'm just going to bring our guest on, Holly Cahoon from Regents Consulting Group. What's going on? Hey guys, very nice to be on the show with you guys. Thanks for welcoming me on board. Absolutely. So I got to ask you, Holly, are you a Tar Heel fan or a Wolfpack? <laughs> well, honestly, I am a UVA fan. That's where I that's where I went to school. So I, I say I'm inside the ACC conference, so it counts. But my husband says anything other than Tar Heels. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a, I am a Terrapin by education by graduation. Ah, okay. I was born and raised in Maryland before I moved to Florida. So we, uh, of course, we're no longer in the ACC, but. Back you in the day, the day. <laughs> uh, we, we had many good game with the with the Cavaliers. Yes. Yeah, we definitely did. And Not all I can say is ourselves, but... Ralph Sampson, right? That's all you have to say. And the rest <laughs> is history. Uh, well, hey, Holly, thank you for coming on the show. So let's just uh, find out a little bit about yourself here and what's going on with uh, Regents Consulting Group. Sure, absolutely. So um, I am a founder and uh, managing partner of Regions Consulting Group, uh, but I've been in the industry for over 25 years. I actually started out, spent the first decade of my career working inside of staffing companies. So I ran a desk, I oversaw recruiters, oversaw recruiting operations, and then kind of gradually made my way into the technology side of the house, um, kind of became a de facto uh, project manager for a major implementation that the staffing company I was working for at the time was doing. Um, and kind of that that was the, the end of the story. From there, I moved on into consulting, which which I call the dark side of things, where we try to <laughs> try to help support our clients uh, through the process of, of those technology transformations and have been there ever since. Uh, worked for a small sta a small consulting firm before founding Regents with a group of partners, all of whom are focused and dedicated on the staffing industry. That's that's what we love. Um, many or most of the folks on our team have backgrounds similar to mine, so we have a real passion for the industry um, and how to bring technology solutions to our clients and customers. Having that upbringing within the staffing industry, I would think that would make you uniquely positioned to provide guidance to staffing firms as far as what types of technology could benefit them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is really core and foundational to, to, to who we are is to have that uh, perspective. We think it, you know, we've been in our clients' shoes before. We've been the buyer. We've been faced with the challenges that you're faced with in trying to select or implement a technology solution. Um, and so, you know, we, we do think that brings a unique perspective to and an understanding of kind of the challenges that our clients are facing, uh, particularly in the world that we're in today, where unlike, you know, maybe a decade ago, there are so many options out there from a technology standpoint. It's a crowded space. It is. It is. Yeah. It's great news for the industry, but it also can make the decision making process, the implementation process, it can make it all a little confusing and a little overwhelming. What are some of the, well, I'll back up a second. There are big staffing firms, there are mom and pop shops. I'm assuming it's not a one size fits all that everybody, hey, this is what you should have in your tech stack. How do you decide what are some things you see in large shops and what, do you, what are some things that you see that benefit and are manageable by the smaller firms that don't have necessarily the resources to, to handle large scale tech stack implementation? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think size is certainly a component of making a decision about the technology stack and the components that, that comprise that. Um, so you do see some variations between smaller firms and larger firms. Um, you know, in the larger firms with more mature IT support organizations, they have the ability to have strong integration platforms and things like that that allow them to kind of plug and play different technologies uh, within their stack. Uh, within smaller firms, you know, there's not that that uh, capacity right internally to support that that much variation in the stack. So looking for things that have the ability to provide kind of a single solution or to simplify the technology stack are, are very, very important important things um, to consider. You know, I also think, though, that in addition to size, that that culture is really a, a key component in what what will define the technology stack for a particular staffing company as well. 
Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the big mistakes that we see clients make in, in, in making selections within their tech stack is thinking of the tool itself as the destination. And really, the, the tool is just the mechanism. It's the means mm-hmm. to the end, right? Mm-hmm. The, the starting and the ending place for any tech in your technology stack should be what what is the business objective here? What problem are you trying to solve? You know, how are we different from other staffing companies and how does our technology reflect that? Um, So it really should be uh, business led and business driven from the beginning. And the technology really is just an enabler. Does it, when we talk about size of firms, a lot of times we talk about, okay, how many recruiters, how many IT staff do you have, et cetera. Does it make a difference as far as the volume? Because you have small firms that do a huge amount of volume Mm -hmm. of recruiting placements. Does that come into play also? Yeah, it certainly should in the decision-making process. Um, Certain tools within the tech stack, depending on what type of staffing you are doing, right, are going to have to be uh, scalable and be able to handle the kind of throughput that you might need, particularly, you know, VMS and MSP kind of programs where you've just got high, high volume, lots of traffic going through. Scalability is certainly a, a consideration and something that that you need to be aware of, whether you're a small firm or a large firm. And I have to tell you, Holly, tech stack, I love marketing. That is a great name. When I see that tech stack, how you're putting everything together for somebody and it's amazing. But I have a question for you now, like change management. I've seen that on your site. How do you get people to change? You know, it's hard for all of us to change. So how do you go in there and say, hey, this is what you need? Yep. That's, that is a great question. And it's one that uh, that I'm passionate about. I know you've had a couple guests on your show before, Lauren Jones and Leslie Vickery. The, the three of us mm-hmm. have done even an ebook kind of focused around change management because it is such an important component to any kind of digital transformation initiative. And it's the, the first one that gets sort of short, short-circuited or, or derailed or not, not enough attention is paid to it. So, and that's one of the things I think from a systems integrator perspective, it's one of the things that I think differentiates an SI, a systems integrator from a, a product company who has professional services, right? Is there's, from a systems integrator perspective, I mean, it's in the name, right? We are all about integration. We are all about how those things work together, how, how all the components of your tech stack come together. Um, and so one of those roles is as a change agent, right? Understanding with your with your clients and customers, what is the nature of the change that you're about to uh, embark on in your journey? Um, how do you navigate through that change, helping to sort of provide the path from point A to point B? And I think also to make sure that all the people within your organization are coming along for the journey, right? Making sure that that all of your stakeholders understand the journey they're embarking on and, and can take the journey with you. Because we all know re- recruiters hate change. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, everybody, all of us have been through a, a change in software, a change in CRM or ATS where, where we've worked. Oh. And inevitably, no one likes to leave the old one. It works, comfortable with it. There's a comfort zone. And there's usually some resistance. And normally from the higher players mm-hmm. to say, you know, no, I'm going to keep doing it my old way. So that's a big challenge to to help them see, I guess, how it can benefit them more by adapting to newer technology. And I think you just mentioned something that's key there, John, is helping helping people understand how it can actually make their lives easier, right? How the change can actually improve their experience, right? And make it easier for them to do their job is kind of a key component in getting buy-in and adoption. And recruiters are not any different than the rest of us, right? Change is hard for everyone. So, you know, it's kind of a common theme, but it is in in the fast-paced world that we're in today with so many technology solutions and things changing every day, it's really the only constant. So it it is something that organizations need to focus on and, and make sure they're managing to with any kind of a change or transformation. And Holly, which ones are harder to change? The big ones or the smaller ones? You know, it might not have a, a big budget. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Let me think about that. Um, I, I think that the smaller ones sometimes, uh, and maybe I'm biased because Regents is a you know a smaller niche firm, but but tend to be structured in such a way that they're a little more nimble, a little more agile, a little easier for them to pivot. 
um, than larger organizations, right? There's a lot of a lot of maturity that goes along with those larger organizations, but that also can add a lot of steps in the process, and it can make that process of shifting and changing course uh, a little bit of a slower process. A lot, lot more red tape. <laughs> there, oh. Yes, there, there definitely can be. <laughs> God, you, and you, you hit, it, hit it on the head. It always seems to take so much longer. You're right. With smaller organizations, especially, especially if it's a smaller privately held organization, mm-hmm. I mean, you can make decisions on a dime. Bam. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Big, ad, big advantage. Yes. Now, the flip, the flip side of that is when it comes to actually having the resources to apply to that, mm. smaller organizations sometimes have challenges, right? Because you're wearing many hats in, in smaller organizations, right? So having having somebody's undivided attention and focus on on a technology implementation or solution is is that that's a tough thing to do in a small organization because there's not a lot of excess fat in the organization. And they're usually heavily dependent upon whatever product they install they're heavily dependent upon that products team of help desk mm-hmm. people if you will yes. to support them because they don't have the internal resources yes absolutely and, and the first component of change management is is not uh, not breaking what you have today right not making right. Your, the, your the lives of your recruiters worse than they were today so you have to be very cautious and upsetting that apple cart <laughs> I'm curious do you have a do you have a horror story like what's the I don't want to use the word worst but you know What's the what's the situation where you went in and you just couldn't believe, oh, my gosh, these guys are like operating like it was 30 years ago. It's so archaic. And how are they even being successful? And let's help them come of age. Yeah, I mean, certainly there have been those horror stories um, that that that, you know. I, I like to uh, protect the names of those who sure. are. I wouldn't want you to name anybody. I know, I know. I but, uh, but I think honestly for us as a, as a stat, as an SI and for regions that those are the opportunities where we have the, the ability to be most impactful uh, because we are kind of, we're able to come in as that outsider. There's, there's nothing that, that we would walk into in a client organization that we haven't in some way, shape or form seen before. Right. So, so all of those things, they may combine together in different organizations differently, but the components of, or the challenges that each one of the organizations are facing, we've seen before. And so it, it's, you know, for us, it's an opportunity for us to really help be impactful and help be that change agent um, and that uh, kind of trusted advisor in the process of, of undergoing that kind of change. Mm. Gotcha. Hey, Holly, trends coming out in 2022. What technology trends do you see like that a staffing firms are jumping on? We know it's like the texting app and all that. What are you seeing where their demands are? They want you to implement that for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for sure, if you look at the market, right, that the, the technology trends are, are going to mirror market conditions today, right? So we, we know we have a, a talent crisis right now, but having um, access to that talent, being able to retain and engage that talent is is really critical. And so we see that reflected in the technology that that um, that our staffing companies are dem- demanding. So engagement platforms that make that easier, um, that that help to continue that conversation between recruiter and candidate, between recruiter and client. Um, those are certainly critical. And then the use of tools like chatbots and things like that, that mm-hmm. automate the kinds of interactions that aren't really high value interactions, but then allow the recruiters to really focus on those meaningful interactions with their candidates and clients are certainly key um, and, and things that we're seeing right now. Uh, I would also say things that have to do with upskilling, reskilling talent, um, mm-hmm. those kinds of things are, are really very, uh, very important right now. And staffing companies really should be on the forefront of that. And how do we transform our workforce so that we can sort of bridge or, or narrow the gap, the, the talent gap that we're seeing right now, for sure. Um, and then maybe uh, the other thing I would say is, is anything at this point that that uh, helps to improve the experience of the people that are interacting with your firm. Yes. That's so, become a huge focus. The candidate experience in particular. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, it's indicative of the market that we're in. But if a, if a candidate has a bad experience or a first experience, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And in this nope. market, they're going to quickly move on to someone else. So uh, I think things that, that help to remove friction from that process and really make sure uh, that 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 relationship is established and maintained and shepherded through the entire process. 
And I guess there's a fine line. You mentioned something that's that I'm very passionate about is that exploring technologies that can automate the recruiting process parts that can be automated without sacrificing the relationship building that needs to take place in order for a recruiter to be successful. I'm assuming there, I mean, there's numerous tools, but you know, you don't want it to seem blatantly obvious that it's an automated chatbot talking to you, but I guess there are tools, some tools are better than others with that interface. And to your point, that experience where it, it makes it not personal, but more personal than if it was completely robotic. Yeah, I, I would agree. Some of it's the tool and then some of it for sure is the way that you configure and engage that tool and what purposes you're using it for, right? Making sure you're lining up particularly things like chatbots and those kinds of things you, that you are, are very strategic and intentional in where you engage those things. Um, and really they should be viewed not as a replacement for the interaction with the recruiter, but to, to bridge the gap, right? To, uh, to keep that person engaged until they can get that live person on the phone and can have the conversation with the recruiter, right? And it tends to free up more time for the recruiter to actually recruit. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Back, back office administrative functions, if, if you will, touch points. Yes. It's being done for them as long as it's coded and programmed appropriately. Yeah, and I think that's a key part of the change, man just kind of circling that back to the change management. I think that's a key part of helping recruiters to understand how these tools can help them and benefit them. You know, there certainly are software and product companies getting into the space right now that are trying to replace the recruiter, right? They're trying to. Never. No, I agree 100%. They've been trying to do that for 30 years. Yes. <laughs> and never. Yes, exactly. I completely agree. Really what, um, and they won't be ultimately be successful, but it's helping recruiters to understand what is the real value they bring to the relationship between them and their candidates as a coach, as a career coach, mm -hmm. and to their clients, mm -hmm. right, as well. Um, we should be at the forefront as a staffing firm of helping our clients see the way back to, you know, how do we get back to the new normal? What does the new normal look like? What have we learned in the process? We have and we have interactions as recruiters with so many you know, clients and candidates every day that we've got knowledge that we don't even think about that we can bring to bear in helping our clients in that process as well. Is there a fundamental call it a blueprint where you say, at a minimum, like not specific products, but components, like this is what a staffing firm should have in their tech stack at a minimum, and then you can expand from there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I do think there are components that are foundational and today you would say are sort of table stakes, right? And it is important to have those in place. While there's so many cool things that we're talking about here around automation and chatbots and engagement, and those are the, the more fun, the sexier things to talk about, you really do have to make sure that you have the foundational components too. So you've, you've got to have a good solid CRM, you've got to have a good ATS solution, you've got to be able to manage pay and bill transactions, you've got to be able to um, have time a time card solution. That, again, all these points of touch points and engagement with your candidates. Um, certainly having the capacity for them to self-serve, I think, is very, very important at this point. And I think, you know, you guys may have mentioned it earlier on, but all of that stuff really does need to have mobile capability. At this point, we're doing everything mm -hmm. from our phones. So I think the, the things that we used to see as nice to haves are really, I would say, becoming part of that sort of must have table stakes um, in the equation of what needs to be in your technology stack. God, that's a powerful statement. And it's so true. What yes, was once nice is. to have is now a must have if you want to compete. It's so yep. true. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> and again, it's one of the, the great things about all of the investment that's going on in the space and in the industry now. It's one of the exciting things about, about the technology that's available and the tools that are available to staffing companies today, as opposed to, you know, a decade ago. I got to ask you, Holly, so how many staffing firms have you went into and it's just the wrong technology? They're like, this stuff doesn't work. They sold it to me. And then you're the, there, the technology rescue. Here you come, boom, like bar rescue. And you come in to save the day. <laughs> Very often. Uh, and I think I mentioned this earlier. That's one of the reasons we, we like to be along the journey even before the selection is made. That's sort of our ideal world, right? Because we can help uh, avoid uh, some of the mistakes of selecting the wrong technology, but it obviously happens, right? It happens a lot of times because uh, there is no 
uh, there is no magic bullet. There is no, there no, is no one ATS solution that is right for every single company, mm -hmm. right? And, and it really does have to be reflective of, of your organization and, and, you know, your values and your culture. So, yeah, we definitely come into those situations often. Um, you know, it, it's the, the, our role in that process is because some of what that is, is maybe not the tool, but it is understanding how to use the tool. And it is, again, from a change perspective, helping recruiters, you know, it, it's human nature to, to bring something new in and then try to turn it into what you had before, right? And so helping them to understand what's the best use of that tool to help accomplish the same goal. So sometimes it's not that the tech isn't right. It's that the, the adoption of it isn't right, that the configuration isn't right, or that they're just not using it in the way that it's supposed to be used. And that's where an SI, again, I think can be a good interpreter between the product company who knows their product in and inside and out, right. But doesn't always speak the business language and, you know, the staffing firms that, that, you know, know what their tools and technologies need to ultimately help them accomplish. It's interesting. And, and from what you just said, that just triggered, I can see the value add of a systems integrator. You're in essence, you're Switzerland. So yeah. you don't necessarily have an allegiance to any one product or company so that you can provide, go in and look at the situation and provide guidance for that company, a very tailored solution based on your overall product knowledge of all the products that are out there and what might work and what you've seen work before versus if I'm a software company, I'm selling you my product. I don't mm -hmm. care about the others. And that may or may not be the right solution for you. Absolutely. I, I always liken it to sort of the an orchestra, right? You know, your product companies are the musicians. You know, they know their instrument inside and out. They know how it's built. They know how to play it just right to make the right sound. Uh, but an SI really is that conductor, right? They are the mm -hmm. one that's making sure that, you know, the woodwinds are tuned the same as the, you know, as the other pieces in the orchestra and that the sound that ultimately is coming out is reflective of all of the components that are a part of the solution and not just a particular solution or not a particular component of the stack, right? So it, it's really kind of that bringing all of them together to make music that is really the role of, of the SI. And it does require us to be objective, right? It does require us to, to um, not be married to a particular technology or solution, but really be making sure we're focused again on the business problems that our customers are trying to solve. It's a great analogy. The orchestra that one. Is, I like that. Man, I'll tell you what, it's uh if you're a new staffing firm or any staffing firm, this is what you gotta do. You gotta consult with Holly. I mean, seriously, <laughs> Dawn. I'm so confused with all the technology out there. They're every day they're throwing stuff at me. Which one's the best? And everybody's the best, right? I mean, seriously, you Absolutely. go to a trade show, you're like well, I can see your head spinning when you're done if you're an owner. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. It is. It's a it can be very daunting. <laughs> oh my gosh. And that's where companies like yours come in very mm -hmm. key to help advise those leaders to say, all right, let us do the groundwork for you. Again, to your point, I love circling back based on their business objectives. It's like, okay, what do you want out of this tool? It's not just, okay, we need an ATS. Well, what are you looking to get out of it? And what are your future plans? And can you grow with that ATS? Um, what, what are your thoughts on companies that have, because you got front end and back end, mm -hmm. and some companies have one system that functions as everything, ATS, CRM, bill pay, all that kind of thing. What are your function? What are your thoughts on that versus individual pieces as a solution? I think that there's no right or wrong answer. I think, again, it depends on your organization. I, I would say in general that I think for smaller firms, the opportunity to simplify your tech stack, right, and be able to have something front to back that can support you and can support your business um, is certainly a value add for those for those smaller organizations that don't have a huge support structure and don't have an infrastructure in place to be managing a lot of technology solutions. Now that that sometimes uh, can change depending on your business model, right? What type of staffing you're in and what level of complexity there is in your organization that may drive you in one direction or another. But in general, those things. Um, tend to drive towards a, a single solution. In the bigger firms, I, I, we do tend to see more of that kind of plug and play where they want to be able to utilize kind of best of breed. 
um, in, in each one of those areas. And then they have things like integration platforms and stuff like that, that really are kind of the under level there, the, the base layer, right, that everything can be plugged into. The other thing we see a lot in, in larger firms is platforms, right, and platform plays, Salesforce, Oracle, things like that, that enable the larger customers to both get the benefits of cloud solutions, right? And, and being, and kind of getting off of heavy on-premise solutions and all the benefits you get in being on that roadmap, but also have tool sets uh, available to you that you can develop and customize and enhance as well where you need to without taking yourself off of the, of the roadmap for the vendor, right? Yeah, web-based and cloud solutions are almost a, a must nowadays because yeah. you want people, especially with what happened the past two years, your people need to be able to operate and do their jobs pretty much anywhere. Yeah. Yes. And that's another place I'd say for the big firms where we're starting to see sort of the, the last lagger in that move to the cloud has been the back office, right? Because those mm. pieces are, they're highly transactional. You have to, you have to be able to be able to manage scale. So moving those to the cloud is, can be a daunting proposition, but there are actually tools out there now that, that are giving um, clients the ability to start to consider that. So we are starting to see some of our larger clients to make the move off of their on-prem back office systems and move those to the cloud as well. Good stuff. And my last question, Holly, is when you meet a client and you work with them right off the bat and you get everything lined up, are you with them for years and keep updating them with all the information? That's our goal and our objective um, as, a, as a company. Regents has, has been very fortunate to maintain the relationships that we have established over the last decade. Um, all, of, all of the top five staffing firms have been uh, clients of Regents and all of them have been repeat customers. And we're very proud to say that because we do try to establish the relationship for the long term. Again, our objective is to be an advisor and that advisory role will ebb and flow with the client's needs. But, but we always want to be there to support them when they need it. That's awesome. Man. One final aspect. How important today when you're looking at someone's tech stack, what role is, is security playing from a malware and virus penetration? How big has that become? That's huge. It's very, very critical. And, and it's something that both small firms and large firms have to be able to address. Um, and it's one of the more complicated areas to address. And that's where I would say from a tool set standpoint, uh, platforms and tools that that have those kinds of things built in, Salesforce and others that that have in their R and D right that, that the mandate to mm -hmm. sort of be remaining compliant with the security protocols required on a global scale, right? Because it, it differs. You know what what's needed in the U S. is different than what's needed in Europe and in other areas of the world. Um, so that's where that kind of uh, platform capability can help sort of plug you in to that kind of um, that kind of structure, that kind of infrastructure without you having to take the burden on yourself. I didn't even think about that. If you've got global organizations, mm -hmm. you're, you're advising U.S. on one type of solution and every other country may have a different solution based on what's going on there. Holy cow. That's pretty complex. It, it is. Yep, it is. And it, and it can get very complex very quickly. <laughs> but again, that's, 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 what, that's what we like. Complexity. I was going to say, you probably enjoy those. We do. We do. It's oh, a lot yeah. of fun. That's awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Good stuff. Hey, Johnny, any final thoughts on our conversation with Holly today? Yeah. First of all, thanks so much for being here. Um, yes. Great knowledge to share and clearly essential to any staffing firm's success now and down the road to make sure you have the right pieces in play. And I like the fact that you said you might have the right pieces. You're just not aware of how to use them effectively or implement them. But what really stuck with me, Richard, is, you know, when you mentioned Holly, you know, the tool is not the solution. This tool is the the means to the end and the objective. And you've got to be strategic and intentional when deciding on what components you need based on your business objectives. So, so many firms try and say, well, let's go get an ATS. Well, let's go get a CRM. Okay, well, back up. What, what's your overall goal? You know, some, you know, you got to walk before you run. And that's where someone like you can come in and really help them take those steps, which is awesome. You, you said it better than I could have. Thanks, John. John's <laughs> the expert. You know that. <laughs> that was your live commercial. Yeah. <laughs> that was. Good promo. Hey, Holly, where can everybody reach you at um, if they need any consulting work done? Yep. So you can get to a, a contact form from Regents Consulting's web, website, www.regentsconsulting.com or sales at email sales at regentsconsulting.com. There it is. And my final thoughts are two words. Tech stack. 
That's it. <laughs> you got to call Holly. Tech stack. She'll get you in the driver's seat. That is a great mm-hmm. phrase. When did that actually come of, come into play as the as the uh, the catchphrase? Because all of a sudden, everybody question. started you know saying tech stack, tech stack. It wasn't like software. It yeah. became tech stack. It is. It is. A, it's very applicable. It's catchy. I love it. <laughs> it I'll is. be saying it in my sleep tonight, John. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, hey, Holly, thank you again for coming on. Everybody, one more time, tech stack. Call Holly. Thank you you guys for having me. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.